came across, um, I guess, a YouTube that you were doing around how selling and marketing has changed and yeah. particularly how the buyer's journey has changed. And I just wanted to yeah. really just pick your brain, I guess, and just your thoughts around that and particularly also how you do research into that um, with, asking customer questions and just just your philosophy on how things have changed well the first thing is um as part of my work with clients well first of all i should back up and say what i do for a living um i call myself a revenue coach mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. it encompasses marketing and selling and the company's reputation and the customer's experience anything at all that that involves the company interacting with customers in order to make money so I teach entrepreneurs and CEOs how to make more money by taking good care of their customers, understanding from the very beginning of the buying journey all the way through to long-term relationship, if it's appropriate, um, how they should be taking care of customers, what they should be doing, mm -hmm. and removing the barriers to the sale, making it easy for people to find them, buy from them, understand what they're selling, and so on. That's the low-hanging fruit. Even that's tricky because it's often uh, management blind spots and things like that. I always work at the CEO or the business owner level because there are um, business modifications that need to be made and they have to be driven from the top. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I do, um, people come to me after reading my content, my book, my blog, and so on. And um, when by the time they come to me, they know me so well because I do practice what I preach. <laughs> and it's easy to figure out uh, what I do for a living and how I can help them. So when they come to me, they have three questions. Um, do you want to work with us? Uh, uh, when could you start? And how much do you charge? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. those are three questions I couldn't answer on the website because I have sliding scale for different size of company and so on. Uh, so even the cost thing I don't mention on the site, but everything else, they've already answered dozens of questions about what I do. And, and I have pretty much, uh, my closing rate is between 85 and 96% mm -hmm. in those situations. Um, the only time I don't get it is if the client turns out to be a jerk. And I have this jerk test where I say I don't work with jerks. And if they smile or laugh like you are, then I know they're not a jerk. Yeah. The jerks think that's not funny. <laughs> <laughs> so it's kind of a great test. But anyway, um, uh, so once they come to me, the first thing I do is I get their their side of the story. So here's what we want to do. Here's what we're having trouble with. Um, here's what we've done so far. And here's how it's working or not. Mm -hmm. Then that's fine. All makes sense. It's a list. I, these are the things that, that we think are important to our customers and so on. Then I go out and I interview the customers and their list is completely different. Mm. There's always an enormous gap between what the customer thinks and what the company thinks. Yeah. So I need to find out what they think. I do this interviewing method that I've worked out. I've tried every single method known to man or woman and um, I've ended up on the phone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, asking open-ended questions and having a conversation. It's not a survey. It's really open-ended questions, which I put in my book. They've been tested over literally thousands of interviews and, and modified so that I get the maximum result from, from those questions. Uh, things like, how do you feel about a product and service? Um, uh, if you were the CEO of our company tomorrow, what's the first thing you would fix? Mm -hmm. Uh, what trends do you see in your market? What's your biggest problem? If you were searching for us in Google, if you assume that's how you started your, your search, what would you type in? Mm. Uh, what do you tell people about us when they ask? Um, so these are, and they just, they just open up and they talk to me for about an hour. And I found by the fifth or sixth phone call, I get a trend. I get absolute patterns by the seventh to tenth phone call of a certain type of customer. I know exactly what the issues are and what we need to fix, what's broken, what needs to be fixed. And the things, the reason that they bought this company, and it's never what the company thinks. Mm -hmm. The company thinks, well, we have this thing and it's really important. And the customer is like, eh, everybody has that. I bought them because of this. Mm -hmm. And this is what people said to me and so on. 
In the course of making these calls, which I do constantly for new clients and existing clients, what I found is in the last couple of years in particular, and then actually there was a tipping point in August of 2011. At that point in time, Google was uh, displaying their advertised paid results the same as they displayed their natural results. You mm -hmm. couldn't tell the difference. Mm -hmm. And they stopped doing that. They went back to making it uh, sort of obvious that they were different. But during that time, and also because people had gotten so involved in LinkedIn and they had access to other people like themselves, they just switched. They stopped going to Google first and they started talking to their friends and saying, I'm thinking of hiring this and this. And this is especially true in B2B, but it's also true in B2C. Um, so they asked their friends first. And then they use that data. They get a short list from their friends, and then they use that data to look at websites, do some searching, and do some more research. And that's when they go to Google. Part of the problem with Google is it's hard to get the right kind of results. Sometimes you'll type something in, and you just can't narrow it down. It's not really a good search engine for services, for example, mm -hmm. uh, which is why Angie's List and things like that have done so well. The other thing that's happened, of course, is that customers are now able to interact with each other via the social networks or reviews or whatever, and they don't need to talk. They don't need marketing copy at all. They're not reading it. They're not paying any attention to it. And all these companies that are churning out this marketing copy are just, they may as well be just, you know, spitting into the wind, as they say. <laughs> it's, it's a completely ridiculous exercise. Um, so customers, you have to be able to let customers talk to customers. Even if you do the writing and end up packaging it up, you've got to get out of the way and let customers talk to each other. Um, and that's scary for companies who aren't treating their customers well, of course, or if they don't understand the problems that they have logistically that they don't even know about that the customer is experiencing, but they don't tell the CEO, and so he never knows. Mm. And I uncover those problems in these interviews and find out where things are broken. Mm -hmm. So that's that's kind of the story in a short encapsulated version. And so it's interesting because it seems like now, do, I wonder whether you think they're um, interviewing customers because they're interested or do they feel that they have no choice because customers sort of now have a voice? It's that, it's those two things. It's also because the CEO knows perfectly well that he's not getting the full truth. I say he, it's half and half, male and female, but just easier to say he. But he's not getting the full truth. If, if, the, if the basement was flooded, by the time the CEO got the message, somebody, by the 10th person up, <laughs> you know, that we had a little water issue in the basement, but it's all taken care of now. Yeah. And that would... I mean, nobody would say it was flooded, it was, you know, it was big, it was 20 feet high, it was all the stuff, the records. They just, everybody kind of does, just minimizes all the problems. Mm. The customer, on the other hand, has this experience that they're going through. And, you know, I, I just, for example, I have a, a company that printed my book. Uh, they, they handle the printing for me and the fulfillment. Mm -hmm. They're not on the electronic side. Um, I noticed the other day that I, I had an issue. Uh, they actually had, had made a mistake on the printing and sort of uh, put together the pages incorrectly on about 25 books. And they got into Europe and mm -hmm. it was a problem. So we had some returns. Mm -hmm. That moment, I had never had anybody return the book. It's sort of standard that you do have returns. I have never had anybody return the book. So, you know, I didn't think it was fair that they were charging me uh, for returns on a problem that was their problem. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get in touch with my rep about that. I couldn't, couldn't remember which person to talk to. So I went online and they have this portal and I said, okay, I'm going to submit this form, right? Mm -hmm. Hit button and nothing happens. Oh, really? Submit and then the, the thing's just turning and turning and turning. And I tried it several times with different browsers. And I thought, you know, here's this CEO running this company who thinks that things are fine. 
and and this was just one indication of the types of problems I've had with them all along. Like they really didn't understand ebook publishing at first, yeah. and they told me, "Just give me a PDF, and it works fine for Kindle." Well, that's not true. It's totally not true. I mean, yeah. you, Kindle yeah. is special, you know. So the CEO has absolutely no idea that they're blowing it in these ways. And I can tell you right now, the webmaster is not going to tell them the submit form doesn't work. No. And how insulting is it to give customers their own portal? <laughs> <laughs> and we're like, we're not home. You know, nobody. <laughs> it's almost like a, a, a pretense of service. It's very good. I may use that. That's excellent. I'll you give can, a quote. You can have that. Um, that's really interesting. So, so say you do all these surveys, which I think is fantastic because, I mean, how else? They're just making assumptions if they don't know, which is what you found. What do they do with that information once you give it back to them? Completely dependent on each company. And this is the other thing that's fascinating about my work. You know, I have a lot of competitors who go out there and talk to people with their marketing and all this stuff. There's two problems. One is they specialize in a certain area. So for the SEO guy, your problem is SEO. For the web guy, your problem is web. You know, for the PR person, it's PR. I mean, they, 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 their solution is what your problem is. And it's not true. I mean, there's no way they're going to uncover the submit button problem with that approach. Uh, so... One, that's one problem. The other problem is that every company is completely different. So if we're talking customer experience, which is what we're really talking about here, of mm -hmm. buying, working with the company and the product, every single company in every single industry is completely different from every other company. They have different kinds of problems. They have different kinds of people in there. They have different kinds of systems. So by finding out individually where they're strong and where they need help, then I come back in and we have a brainstorming and planning meeting. I give them two reports, this big, long conversation, word for word transcribed report. I anonymize it for the sake of the person giving me the data. Mm -hmm. and before I interview them, I say, I'm going to record this because I can't write everything down as fast as you can talk. But I'm then going to anonymize it. When I get the transcription back, I'm going to strip out your name and company information. And, and then I'm going to split it up into categories so it's taken out of context. Mm -hmm. The end result, my client gets the truth without the source. Yeah. Which everybody. And the client then doesn't say, oh, that guy always says that and, you know, dismisses what is really a, a valid comment. So they get this big report of all this this word for word, here's what they said. You know, they really get into the brain. It's like reading your life story. It's like reading everybody who ever knew you in high school, and they're now telling you what they really thought. <laughs> 150 pages, and they read every word, and they memorize it because they're, they're finally seeing themselves the way the world sees them. And they see those trends. They see that, you know, of the seven people, they all said, this is your problem. This is what needs. So there's this clear path. And then we have this. And then I have a summary and recommendations report. And I also have been adding uh, ramifications lately because not only do you have recommendations, but here are the ramifications of what you're doing and what we need to do about it. Mm. We meet. The leadership team gets together and we talk all this through and we make this action plan. And the action plan says, okay. This is a big problem, this thing over here. We've got to fix that right away. And we need a new person or we need a new system or whatever it is. We need to get this solved. And then here's the other stuff that we need to work on long term. And it usually involves, part of what happens is almost always involves some website work. They usually are not selling themselves well on their website. Um, and other marketing concepts like, you know, this is what they really care about. You're not talking about it. We should do an email campaign that, that focuses on that. There's very often a uh, management shift that needs to happen. There's some manager somewhere that's just completely blowing it. And when we need to get that one out and get a new one in or, or give that person a chance to fix what they're doing or, mm -hmm. so it's, that's why I call myself a revenue coach because I never know mm -hmm. until I'm calls what the problems are. The beauty of been do doing this for decades 
is I haven't met a problem now that I can't solve. I mean, if you say to me, this is the problem, I go, oh, okay, there's 10 different ways to solve it. We're going to do this one because of, you know. So I'm now this walking problem-solving encyclopedia. Just I've been <laughs> And there's only a few things that people do that are bad, and they do them over and over and over again because it's all about ego and politics and blindness and, you know, all that stuff. <laughs> Fantastic. So do you... Um only interview the customers of a company or do you ever interview the staff within a company? Definitely interview the staff, um, off the staff, uh, certain people, you know, whatever's appropriate. Uh, I also interview partners and sometimes I to improve the relationships with partners like a new partner portal. IBM did that with me where I redesigned the sales and marketing portion of their big partner portal. Uh, they sell half their software products, we're talking $40 billion worth or $12 billion worth of, of uh, software. I shouldn't say half. They sell 40% of that through partners. Mm. We needed to give them data in a fast way. And, the, and the, big, the big mantra there was there's a lot of great stuff in here, but I can't find it. Mm. So we need it easier for them to navigate to that data. Um, uh, so it, it just depends. Client needs. Sometimes I may interview uh, people that are sort of aligned with the company, but they aren't really a partner. Maybe they're, you know, in some other role. But anyway, I, I interview whoever's appropriate. But we always start with the customers because you want more revenue. Mm. And what sort of companies are coming to you? Like, are, do they do they fit into a certain um, mold of? Yes, this is triggered for me something that I need to resolve. Um, is like you said, you deal with the CEOs, but I'm just wondering if it's a certain type of um, client that's attracted to really trying to get to the bottom of of this and make improvements, or is so it? My sweet spot is the the um, the company that's established. Mm -hmm. Uh, they have some number of sales. It could be two million. It could be twenty million. It could be two hundred million. That's kind of my sweet spot. And they want to get to the next level, and they can't get there with what they have. They, they're just feeling like they're either slipping, mm -hmm. and it's scary because they're slipping, or they've got to get to the next level, and they know they're not going to get there using the systems and processes that they currently have. Mm -hmm. I have specialized in B2B, very technical uh, products because I've been in high tech for 40 years. So, I mean, I can just tell you how the internet works and how computers work and all that stuff. Um, so I've tended to gravitate towards that. So people selling to engineers or IT people. But when the web came along in 1994, everything started getting technical. And so I started getting clients who were in the travel industry, the pharmaceutical industry. So I handle, and, the, and a lot of the consumer side as well, retail companies and so on. But it's really the company that's here and they want to get here. Mm. Can't figure out how to do it. And then the other thing is um, I tend not to work with venture-backed companies. Um because they they have more money than than is good for them, and they're misusing it. Not they're not really caring about the customer. They're all about branding and making themselves feel good, and it they don't you know the jerk factor is just too high in those situations. <laughs> I've got two questions that come to mind. One is about um, how the buyer's journey has changed, and I listen to. Um, one of the webinars that you were giving and I've heard this a lot where you know the seller used to do a lot up front and now the buyer is actually doing a lot of that research up front before they actually contact can you tell me whether you're seeing that through your research and just what you feel about that change in in the buyer pattern yeah in my speeches I talk about the fact that the um it used to be 80 percent of the questions or, or the the for the web please I mean even Google, I would say, customers got 20% of their questions answered, and then they had to go to a salesperson to get the rest. Now that's flipped. And I would say it's even more than 80%. Now they're probably getting 90% of their questions answered, and by the time they're calling a salesperson, 
their their questions are so specific. Okay, I know this, 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 and this about you. I've put you in my grid. I've got you characterized. And now I need to know, can you do this one little thing? Okay. Mm-hmm. And and you better have a salesperson on the phone who can answer that question. And this is where the gap between the buyer's process and the seller's process has just gotten enormous. I mean, this is a tsunami that's just making its way through the world where the buyers are like, I want this. And the sellers are going, no, no, no. That means we have to have these technical, you know, highly trained people or we have to give them access to databases or, you know, that's too much. We just want them to stand there and say, this is great and we love it and you're going to be happy and limited only by your imagination and ROI and blah, blah, blah. And the customers are just, I mean, they're just so over it. They're just like, they're they're like, you know, gang me. They just <laughs> can't stand the idea of hearing another salesperson tell them all that junk. <laughs> it's bad. So I, can always- I mean, people trying to date and the guy is sitting there and he's wearing this lounge lizard outfit and he, the minute he walks in, the girl's like, oh, no, out of here. <laughs> it doesn't look good impression, does it? Can, can I ask you where you've... Um, gone in to work with a company and you found a really good example of how they are listening to their customers but they want to take it to the next level so they've got some mechanism yes Um, and you know this is kind of interesting because this is usually a situation where they're actually very close to the customer there's a, a company called bizarre voice and they make software they're based in austin texas very smart people um it's shifted now because they've kind of um some of the great people have left so it's not as great of a company as it was but when they were at their peak what they were doing was uh helping people take any review of their product and syndicate it suck it into their own portals and systems so they could publish customer reviews they would curate them very often. If it was a really terrible thing, they might try to get back to them and fix the problem rather than post the thing. But for the most part, they were posting uh, the good and the bad reviews on their site. And this company makes it possible to go out and do that. Very smart company, understands their customers. Customers were basically delighted with the service. But they wanted to sell to a different audience. And I have another company, a marketing automation company that's absolutely top of their game uh, company and same kind of thing. They've asked me to come in and say, look, we're selling well to the marketing people, but the marketing people don't have enough power to convince the CEO and we need to get the salesperson on our side as well. Mm -hmm. And we need to figure out what they care about, who they really are and what they really care about right now. And so I'm doing this psychological detective work for them. And really figuring out how these people buy, what they care about, what their concerns are as they're trying to purchase, um, you know, what their buying process list looks like. They have to meet these criteria and so on. Um, so that's pretty common, actually. Mm. And what about the use of personas? This seems to be a bit of a buzzword at the moment. What's your thought process around that? You know, personas are great if they're based on real people. If you sit in a com- in a committee in a meeting room and make them up, you may just be you know just you may as well not have bothered <laughs> because it, it's even worse. Now you've taken all of your misperceptions and the insulting. I mean, really, a lot of times it's very insulting, and and you've applied it in a way that's got more structure to it, so it seems more real, mm-hmm. and it's. The- the best example of that was um, a gal named Dareth Lamka, who's got a marketing uh, uh, um, portal, I guess the best way to describe it. And she was up doing a speech, and a bunch of us were in the audience. Um, hang on. My phone's telling me we're going to talk in 15 minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> uh, I was at an e-metric summit uh and speaking there, and she was one of the speakers as well. And she got up and talked about, she said, okay, I want you all to close your eyes, and I want you to imagine a woman who's getting government assistance, who has a couple of children, 
Um, yeah, I think that was those were the requirements. And she, I just want you to picture that person. So we all did. And then she, she opened your, her, your, she said, open your eyes. And up on the screen was a picture of Princess Di. Hundreds and hundreds of people in the room. Not one of us was thinking about Princess Di. You know, we were thinking of the, the quintessential welfare mother, you know. So uh, to me, that's how bad these are. Because when I go out and I interview the customer, the thing that you can learn about customers using all of your own data is how they do things and what they do. You can guess about what they did or to look at what they did, but you don't know why. You don't know why they picked you. You don't know why they came after you and wanted this and what problem they were trying to solve. And, you know, it's very insulting for somebody to come to you and say, well, you have brown hair. Therefore, I'm going to make these assumptions about you. But you know perfectly well that they're missing. You know, it's like when they do those multiple choice surveys where they say, you know, would you be interested in A, B, C, or D? And you're like, well, no. <laughs> None of I'm interested are on your list. And so, in fact, uh, what was it today? I got a, a, a an email. Oh, no, I went to the Forbes magazine site. And they asked me if I'd be willing to answer some questions while I was looking at their content. And I'm always curious about that. So I said, yes. The first question they asked me was, what's your age? Um, how is this going to help you? How is this going to help me help you? You know, what What are you going to do with this data that's actually, and, and it's none of your business. You know, they ask income, they ask, I mean, it's like, it's none of your business. If you really want to sell more to me, ask me what I'm interested in. I mean, I could be 85 and be interested in, in technology in a way that nobody would ever expect. Yes. So, again, this, this whole persona thing has really, um, it, it, it just, it, it, it angers me and it frightens me both because it's such an insult to the real customer with real needs and very specific things that they want to deal with. I knew that it would fire you up. <laughs> so that's great. Um, I, I also wanted to ask you about the, I guess, the context between marketing and selling and the gap that you see in organizations around that, just for another fiery discussion. Yeah, yeah. So marketers are cats and salespeople are dogs. <laughs> and that's a problem right there because the salespeople, and I'm, by the way, I started out in sales. I, I always tell people I'm a recovering salesperson, so I can say whatever I want about salespeople. <laughs> I actually long been recovered. I'm like somebody who hasn't had a drink for 30 years or something. Um, but what I've learned about the two things, I actually got into marketing because as a salesperson, I was so disgusted with the tools I was getting from marketing that weren't working. So I said, okay, we've got to fix this problem. So then I went into marketing and found out why those tools were not working because marketers never talk to customers. So that's a problem. Um, salespeople are very immediate and they don't think in terms of bigger trends. So if you, in fact, I've known CEOs, I've worked with CEOs who used to be salespeople. And every single time you'll have a meeting with them at lunch and you'll agree on the strategy and you'll be, okay, everything's fine. This is what we're going to do. Then they go back to their office. You go back to your office. And I had this happen. It was so perfect. I called this, the CEO after 10 minutes after our lunch. I said, oh, I just want to verify we, we did agree on this and this. And he goes, oh, I'm so glad you called. John was just in my office, and he has this great idea. We should do this other thing because of what he just talked to this one customer who has this. So they a company like a Chinese fire drill. The last guy they had lunch with is the one they're going with the strategy. It's all about closing this one deal. They never back up and take that bigger view. Now, marketers are good at that but they don't talk to customers. So they don't actually get if. And so what I try to teach them in my book, I mean, every single marketer in the world should be reading my book. Frankly, I don't care if they buy it. I don't care how they do it, but they should be interviewing their customers like this. They make a half a dozen calls and they're like, Oh, now I get it. This is what they want. Mm -hmm. And then they can go to the CEO and everybody else and say, I know you think this, but you know what? I just talked to six customers they don't even care about that. They want this. 
And it's a completely different space than the usual, well, I think this, and everybody's doing social media, so we should do social media. You know, it's just totally bogus. And then the stuff doesn't work because they haven't talked to real customers and they don't know. And then they get fired in two years. Yeah, exactly. Last two years, that's it. Yeah. Sales have a little more credibility with CEOs because they at least close the deal once they get it. Mm. Well, as they used to, but they at least have the the myth, the perception that they're going to close the deal, and so there's there's real ROI, you know, there's real revenue there. Yeah. But they don't think strategically, so the whole the whole thing. So neither of them are doing their job properly to mm. make the whole. So so you've you've written this book. Where to next? What are you working on? Something else? What's happening in your radar world at the moment? Think I'll, uh, <laughs> I'm always working. I love what I do. I'm just going to be dying at my keyboard. I think I'm just, you know, it's just, it's just, I love this. And the better I get, the older I get, frankly, the better I get because I'm just, I just, I don't have any doubts about what's the, what the solution is. I mentioned to you before. Yeah. I'm going to be writing about three different guides in my head. Small, small guide, kind, of very, very short. You know, here's very prescriptive um, about hiring people, uh, creating a good website, and the technologies available to you to do that, and how websites are turning into to applications now. They're not just brochureware. They're really mm-hmm. want to do something, and you have to make it easy for them to do that. Um, there's a lot of things that we're C-level managers get led down this rosy path and they get totally distracted by, again, the the fads, social media or whatever it is, which has its place, but it's not the end all. Mm. When I interview customers, I ask them, are you involved in social media? Would you expect to find us in social media? Would you look for us there? You know, is this part of your buying process? And if the answer is no, you know. No-brainer, isn't it? Be there. You still have to do something. Uh, because what I'm finding, interestingly enough, what people are doing with tweets now is they'll go and they'll look at your Twitter feed and they'll see what you've been tweeting about as a, as a rule. I mean, they kind of look at your history of tweets. Mm-hmm. And they say, this person thinks... So it's very important for people not to tweet stupid stuff because customers are actually looking there and saying, do I really want to associate myself with this person or not? Um, so anyway, I'm always working. I'm constantly, I've got more business than I can handle at any given moment. I'm just always full up and I'm always solving business problems. And it's just, that's what I do. I just love it. Oh, it's fantastic. And you're obviously passionate about it. And and I just so wanted to speak to you because that's always a starting point for me, um, is the reason I left corporate and went back really to run my own business is to get back to customers and small businesses seem so much closer. Um, they seem to have that bit a little bit more nailed because they, you know, it's so it's so close to them. And, um, and it forced me to think much more about customers. So the starting point always is to, to do that research. Um, so I really appreciate it. I, you interviewed me now. I get to interview you. Sure. So <laughs> where did you come from? What's your background? Um, so I'm based in Australia in Melbourne. Um, my background is I started off doing a teaching degree and finished that and decided I was too young to teach. And so I sort of, much of my parents discussed, went and worked at McDonald's and just thought I'll just play here for a bit. And I'm really creative. So I sort of thought that um, we could do some promotions when people came in. We could work with other businesses and and service the customers better, and that started to work. And I thought, well, what is this? This is marketing. So I'll go back and study that at night. And um, and so I did. And and then I sort of just went from company to company. But my passion's always been IT. So I'm a bit of a geek. And just at that time, fortunate enough for me, it was it was this just this groundswell of internet starting and then all these other applications and tools. And so that was really fun for me. So I would work in an IT company in HP for about 10 years and then I'd come home and play. 
And probably around five, six years ago when I had my son, I thought I'm not going back to that corporate world. I, I went through that roller coaster of, okay, I've done the loop of 12 months. I know what this is like. It's very short term. I can't keep doing this. I'm not growing. And to me, that's the most important thing. The learning is, is much more important. And I think today, really, this personal development for um, younger people is more important than the weight. And so I decided to start my own business and, and pretty much just just did. I, I can't even remember how it started, to tell you the truth. But I just did. And, and, and so that's gone through an evolution for me as well from from being a marketer to now I turn myself a customer-centric marketer because there isn't, frankly, that many of us that hold the customer at the centre. It, it just isn't. And I think it's difficult for businesses to do that because especially once they're established, it challenges everything they've, they've put in place. And so it's a difficult decision to throw it out the window and start again. You know, build your business from the customer first out. Um, but that's what I'm trying to do. So my, uh, I guess where I am in that whole journey is I'm discovering what service design is, which is a whole thought um, around how you design a product from a from a customer's perspective, and taking that methodology and trying to apply it to to a marketing base. And like you said, it's not it's difficult because service design sort of cuts through a lot of different aspects within a company. You know, you've got you know the service part, you've got the marketing part, you've got the HR part. It is a it is a methodology or a mindset. And I think that's where my mindset is. And it sounds very similar to you in that. You know, we're not trying to go in and just fix one little bit. We're doing it from a customer point of view first. And so it's an interesting journey and I'm just enjoying it and, and trying to speak with people like you to, to basically learn. I don't really care if no one listens to it. For me, it's just an opportunity to learn. Well, my husband calls that being a learn-it-all versus being a know-it-all. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, and it's a fun way to live. I mean, I'm, I'm, I love tech because, it, it, you, you, I mean, from the day I started, I mean, I was selling machine shop tools when I was 17, and I failed miserably. I was an absolute failure because nobody trained me. They just gave me the catalog and said, here, you're the first woman in the United States to sell machine shop tools. Go for it, babe. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't understand any of that stuff. And I was so embarrassed, I swore to myself that I would learn everything I could about selling and everything I could about technology. And I've never stopped. I mean, you, you can never stop. You can never stop and rest for any moment. You just That's have to. terrible. <laughs> There's these, this big problem that you're trying to solve and I'm trying to solve, which is, you know, at the center is the company. I mean, when you were saying what you were saying, it reminded me of a conversation I had with some a guy at IBM once where we were talking about the way the portal should be designed and all this stuff. And he kept going up to the whiteboard and every time he was illustrating his thing, he would put IBM in the middle and then all these spokes coming out. And, like, and every time I went up, I was like, no, here's the customer in the middle. Here's how they see all this stuff. It's, it is a very difficult thing. And, and the CEO is sort of the head of this club, this insider's club. And there's plenty to do. You come to work and there's all these people running around and all these problems to solve. And you can spend all day doing that and never, ever thinking once about the customer coming in and, and you know, interacting with your company and your people and your website and all that stuff. So you'll have a, a fun time doing that for years and years because it's just, it's like teaching people how to be... Um, generous you know instead of self-centered it's it's a it's a it's a lifetime of employment <laughs> <laughs> well it seems to me I, I had this discussion with oh, I'm trying to remember who I interviewed but it, it was a debate I was having you know is it is it the people that fall into this field just empathetic is it just the way because I always think that you know as a kid I, I just always thought of others and I was in I don't know if I was overly thoughtful but I actually had them in my mind's eye a lot about how they were feeling I suppose I call that empathy and and whether I'm you know at home thinking about that or in a company I'm always thinking about how that makes other people feel and what they would be thinking and it just seems to me that that not a lot of people do that I just thought everybody was like that so 
it was surprising to separate you know yourself so much from that person that you were affecting and so I find that when I'm sitting in and I'm consulting for a, a larger company now I'm constantly doing that I'm putting myself exactly where the customer was and challenging decisions and that's really fun <laughs> it is it allows you to make an enormous difference you know not just for the the customer who's sort of the end beneficiary of it but if the company starts doing things the way the customer wants them to then all of those people are still going to have jobs exactly started out being a teacher i was going to be a music teacher and by the time i got out of school uh, the music, the teaching jobs were just non-existent and I had already been selling for years. And so I thought, well, I'll just keep on the marketing side, the selling side. But I also always kind of wanted to be a social worker or, you know, help people kind of get out of one phase or one issue where they're stuck here and they need to get that they need this transformation. And when you transform an entire company, when you help a company make that transformation, there's just nothing more rewarding. I mean, I love it. The employees say to me, oh, geez, you know, they finally got a clue. Because they often know. I mean, the people lower down who are talking to customers actually know that there's a problem. Absolutely. And solve it. Yeah. You know, they they can't, they don't have the evidence, which is why I always go out and make these interviews. I People start wanting to ask my advice before I said, no, you know what? I could tell you a million things right now after you've given me your side of the story, but I'm going to be off base. Even with all my experience, I'm going to be off base. I'm not going to be talking about the stuff that actually matters to your customers. And once you do that and the company starts shifting, oh, it's so much fun. It's really fun. That is. Oh, I, I, I really appreciate your time and, and thank you so much. And I'll put a link to your book and your website on this and forward this to you. And, um, yeah, I hope we keep in contact. It's a, it, it sounds like it's an interesting journey you've had so far. Too. I would like that. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.